Good morning, afternoon, or evening, whenever you happen to be listening to this. Uh, this is Gene. Josh is not able to join us this week. In fact, this week is two weeks ago almost that we started this. We uh, did a wonderful fourth episode, and unfortunately, it didn't record where we could then present it to you. There were many times where you just saw one of us staring at you and listening to the other person, but you couldn't hear the other person. And then I got bubonic plague. Josh had bubonic plague or the flu, and he is now trying to um, catch up on some schoolwork. So you're stuck with me today. We would first want to thank you for uh, all the listeners. It's amazing how many of you are are out there listening to us. Uh, five different continents. That's amazing. That's mind blowing. Along with our YouTube channel, again, we would encourage you to subscribe. We would uh, we thank you for that if you have already done so, and please send us questions, comments, anything that we can help you with. Uh, Club Fitting Chronicles at Gmail is where you can reach us. Uh, Josh has been working at trying to get us up on Facebook and Instagram, but being sick and having poor internet connections and everything else, that was part of our problem the last time, um, has made it really challenging. And so we are still working on that. So today, our big topic is talking about the clubs. And do your clubs match the way you swing? Okay, and we're going to get into that. Uh, but I want to go back a little bit to the last time we got together and talk about uh, the clubs that you may currently be using or the companies that you are aware of. And a lot of people kind of think that they've been around forever and that these are the gold standard. And that's not true. Um, a lot of these companies are pretty new as if you look at the world of major companies. Um, but before I even go into that detail, I want to just remind you, you know, little things like uh, in the component world, uh, Stephen Ocker, the guy who just won on the Champions Tour and, and won their title for the year. He's playing with New Level. And we talked about them a couple weeks ago. Um, I've known about them for a little bit of time. Uh, they make wonderful heads and they will put the clubs together for you if you give them the specs that you want. Um, or you can have somebody uh, purchase the heads for you and put them together for you. Or if you know how to do that, I guess you could do that yourselves. Um, you know, Patrick Reed was playing with Grindworks a couple of years ago. Uh, many of you probably have no idea who Grindworks is, but it's, uh, they make, again, really nice heads. They're a small company, you know, compared to a lot of the big companies you hear about, but they make really fine equipment. Um, there have been some tour players, uh, people would come into my shop and say, you know, I was looking in so-and-so's bag and I saw some KZG. What is KZG? Again, it's a component company. It's a small company in Southern California and they make really good stuff. Golfsmith, Scott Verplank played with Golfsmith. Uh, equipment and again, they're just a, they were making components, uh, and there were a lot of other guys out on tour that were playing with Golfsmith. In fact, Payne Stewart was working with my mentor Tom Wishan, who was one of the vice presidents at Golfsmith. Uh, in fact, they were supposed to meet the day Payne Stewart's plane crashed up in uh, the Dakotas. Uh, they were had been working on a set of irons, and unfortunately, you know, with Payne's passing, that didn't happen. But again, it. You know, a well-known player playing with components, not major um, brands. The difference between most major brands in the component world? Capital. How much money they have for advertising. A lot of those companies, they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars. The guys that are playing those clubs, they're under contract to play those clubs. They are making uh, a good sum of money playing those. And even the lesser guys, there's something called the, the Daryl survey, and they look at everything from what kind of spikes do you have on your shoes to uh, what clubs are you playing? And if 
on if you record on the general survey, you know, a lot of tour players, you know, they're under the weather. But hey, if I get to the first tee and swing my driver, I get three thousand dollars. So I will climb out of bed, go out to the first tee, play the first hole and then withdraw. That happens. OK, they they get paid for those clubs. Um, I was thinking about the our modern clubs and, and had done this with my uh, golf academy students years ago. Um, TaylorMade, most of you think of TaylorMade, you know, big companies been around forever. Now they actually started off. They made a metal driver head, and they called it the P Pittsburgh Persimmon Driver. Um, Pittsburgh because of the steel companies that were there, and it was made out of metal. And that was their big claim to fame. That was the only club they had, the, that Pittsburgh persimmon. And they turned it into a major company. Eli Calloway, my putter is way over there. I can't reach it. But Eli Calloway was a wine guy in Southern California. And his uh, when he bought the uh, company, they were making hickory shafted putters, hickory shafted wedges. And I have been told, I was not around at the time in Southern California, that Mr. Calloway would be known to show up at golf courses with a trunk full of clubs and try selling golf clubs out of his trunk. Until one day he hit it big and became a national brand. Titleist. Uh, I lived in this uh, at the time when I moved there, it was a smaller town, Escondido, California, and there was this company called Golf Craft. And Golf Craft was on Mission Road, and their building was still sitting there. And a, a bigger company called a Kushnet bought them. And eventually that became Titleist. Uh, my son's father in law used to grind some of the iron heads that would come in and take off some of the excess metal and stuff. Um, not a big company, but they became big because somebody had invested a lot of money in them. You know, if you're old like me, you probably remember clubs like Walter Hagen, you know, the Haig Ultra Series. That was like the top of the brand, brand name market back in the mid 70s. Uh, I played with Haig Ultras. In fact, I was looking at in my closet at my driver and I measured the uh, face angle on it. And no wonder I couldn't hit it straight. I remembered having measured it before, but it's three degrees open. Um, but that was a, a major brand. Yonex, Phil Mickelson played with Yonex. How many of you have Yonex in your bag? Um, Spalding. Lee Trevino was the big uh, endorser of Spalding clubs. And I remember when Spalding became available to, to club makers just before their demise. Founders Club. Uh, some... A uh, guy named uh, Vokey, Bob Vokey, I think is, yeah, that's his name. He was making clubs for Founders Clubs. He was helping make wedges. A friend of, another friend of mine, Jeff Sheets, was designing Founders Club. Uh, Jeff went on to work with uh, Swing Science. So, again, those were like big clubs, companies, McGregor. You know, nobody was bigger than McGregor. Jack Nicholas played McGregor. Um, it was the top of the line. And they started to make a comeback back in the, oh, I think it was in the late 90s, early 2000s, and something happened capital-wise, and they went under. Uh, if you're a Fre Freddie Couples fan, Lynx. Lynx was huge. Um, again, uh, Golfsmith bought Lynx just before, uh, back in the 90s. And I think that's what um, uh, Payne Stewart was going to be playing with, was Lynx. But it was basically, at that point, a component company. Uh, yes, they would go out and buy shafts and stick shafts into heads and send them out to stores, and you could buy them already made. But for for uh, people like me, I was making Lynx clubs. I was one of the top Lynx dealers in the country. And they, you know, the components were wonderful. And they made them so that they were easily adjustable weight-wise. I had a, a, a weight pocket that I could add up to nine grams of weight into if I needed to make something heavier. Um, and I could hand, have them hand-picked if I needed something lighter. 
you know, from the component world, when I order equipment still, you know, I've made a few sets uh, in the last month. And I tell them I need this two degrees open if it's a driver or two degrees shut or a half a degree shut or I need um, the weight of these clubs to be, you know, X and they will hand pick them. You know, if I need the lofts a degree stronger, I can have them hand pick them or bend them. Um, and so a lot of things in the component world that you never really think about, but all those other companies, TaylorMade, Callaway, Tylos, they're all component companies. The difference is, is they don't really do that hand picking for you. They're not going to supply people who are putting the clubs together and fitting you. They don't do it that way. Uh, it's too much work and it's uh, that market is a, a smaller niche market and their goal is to sell. Their goal is just to get in the door and out of the door with a new set of clubs. You know, Americans buy clubs different than most of the world. Americans, and I'll say this respectfully because I am one of them, Americans are stupid. Um, they pick their clubs based on who their favorite player is and, uh, you know, so-and-so is playing this, so I will hit it just like them if I play that. Well, no, that's not the case. First of all, uh, having worked with some of the tour player uh, clubs, a lot of them are not just like the ones you get in the store. I played golf with a former U.S. Open champion, and I remember looking through his bag, and he was playing for a major company, and I said, you know, I have never seen these out on the market. And he goes, well, there's, there's, they've made a couple of sets of those. Oh, well, I just happen to own both of them. Oh, okay. So, you know, even though he was playing a major company's, you know, had his, uh, their name on his bag and all that stuff, there weren't clubs you or I were going to buy. And that's not unusual. Uh, I've worked with some tour player clubs that have been bought at auctions and stuff like that. And, you know, lead tape everywhere, heads different sh uh, shapes than what you're you know, used to seeing with that same, quote, name on uh, recognition on the back. Um, that's not unusual. The clubs that the pros are playing are made to fit them. If you can get that kind of service from them, great. But most people can't. And so... It's trying to figure out, well, how can I find something that will be able to be fit to me? Um, you know, the, again, Americans, you know, we buy clubs because you know, they're the number one driver in golf. Well, why are they the number one driver in golf? A lot of times because they paid the most money to get on the people playing them on the Daryl survey so they can say they are the number one number one driver in golf or number one drive or irons or, you know, the number one putter. Um, it's interesting to me, you know, the world series just happened a couple weeks ago. You know, how many of you would race out and buy Bryce Harper's bat and expect the same results? Or you're watching NASCAR and you go, Oh, so-and-so is driving a, blah, blah, blah. and so I have got to have one of those. That car is not going to resemble anything like the car that you saw on television. You have to understand that about golf clubs. They're, there's only so much you can do with them. The question is, is can it be done to make it work for you? So uh, other things along that, you know, when they sell you on things like this will give you a perfect launch. How do they do that? I don't understand how you can give guarantee me perfect launch or perfect spin with your clubs because if I hit it four degrees up, or if I hit four degrees down, that will create completely different situations and the club is not able or smart enough to be able to change my swing to make it so that I'm doing exactly the way they wanted me to. Um, or the other favorite, uh, the shaft was picked for this club head. Well, it doesn't matter. The club head, I've never had a club head re re reject a shaft. What it needs to be picked for is the golfer. And that's what we're going to be talking the rest of the, this podcast about. And you have to excuse me since I'm trying to play the role of Josh and Gene. Um, but Josh and I had been talking about different types of swing. And basically, when I'm looking at a swing, 
I have categorized it into one of three types of swing. Either it's super, super aggressive, and like in the modern day, John Rahm comes to mind. You know, short backswing and just fires through the ball. Extremely quick, hard tempo, um, makes a mighty lash at the ball. Um, there aren't a lot of those people, but there are. Uh, there's enough of them that I need to, to keep an eye for that person. Uh, then you have the average swing. And for the average swing, I picked like a Jordan Spieth. Um, it's not that he doesn't hit the ball far. has nothing to do with that. It's where is the uh, power or speed being generated? You know, a lot of tour players, the speed is generated in the last foot, foot and a half before the ball. That's where it matters. doesn't matter how fast I am up here. It matters where I am down there. Um, and then you have players like, and I picked a, a smoother tempo than Jordan Spieth, like a Matt Kuchar. Kind of just looks like he's out, you know, in the park. Oh, look, a golf ball. Let's hit it. Um, nice, smooth tempo. Those different tempos dictate a lot of what you need to be thinking about when it comes to shafts and weights. You know, the John Rom type, I went through and, you know, trying to find information out on, on uh, the internet. John Rom is playing with a 75 to 80 gram driver shaft. Don't have any idea what the swing, I mean, the swing weight is, but my guess is it's fairly high. Um, he uses 85 gram shafts in his fairway woods. He uses 125 gram shaft in his driving iron and same with his regular irons. Why? Because of the fact that he is moving that club so quickly, he has to feel it at some point. It's like if I take a plastic bat and a regular bat, you know, if you're a baseball player and you're up, you know, I'm pitching to you and you're able to catch up to my, you know, 85, 90 mile an hour, 65 year old fastball and you're catching up to me and you're able to make contact and I hand you a plastic bat and I say, okay, now do it. There's not a chance. You know, going from that uh, heavier bat to that lighter bat, you, you won't even look like you're swinging properly a bat because it's just too light for you. Well, in the golf world today, that's what they tend to be making most clubs. Most clubs are light. The shafts are light. The swing weights are light. That doesn't fit a lot of golfers. You know, Jordan Spieth, you know, he's, his driver weight, same with Matt Kuchar's, the 60 in the 60 gram range. They're playing 70 plus gram shafts in their um, fairway woods. Jordan plays with a 95 gram shaft in his hybrids and 125 gram shaft in his irons. And again, my guess is the reason for that, well, two reasons. One, he's probably, that's what he's been playing because he's a young guy and he's used to that. But the second thing is, is it gives him the feel of the golf club that he needs so that he can square the club up. And if he doesn't square the club up, he feels what he didn't do. Um, Matt Kuchar, on the other hand, instead of the 95 gram uh, hybrid shaft is using an 80 gram hybrid sh uh, shaft. And again, the reason is he doesn't, it's not as quick of a transition. It's not, he's not going after it quite the same as a Jordan Speed or a John Rahm. So he doesn't need as much weight to feel that because he has time to pick that club up in his feel. You know, Matt's using 110 gram shafts uh, before he was using some Aerotech shafts. And I, I'm thinking it was he was using the 95 gram Aerotechs. Um, you know, on the women's tour, it's the same way. You know, you take a, a Lexi Thompson, you know, super aggressive. She's using 100 gram shafts, the Nelly Corda. Hits the ball probably just as far, but not nearly as aggressive a move. She uses 80 gram shafts. Then you got Lydia Ko, who's leading right now in their uh, their final um, tournament of the year. You know, kind of control. She's using 70 gram shafts. So the way you swing the club, the amount of the the not the speed necessarily generated. But the change in direction, the um, where are you accelerating from way up high, you're accelerating down lower? Are you able to hold the angle and you you know look very smooth through the ball? That's going to be a driving force. 
you know, and with that, not just the weight of the shaft, but with that, you're going to have to take into account how much headway do you need? When I stop and think of all the thousands of club uh, that I've built over, over my career as a club builder and fitter, um, you know, the average swing weight from most clubs today are ranged between D0 and D2. Uh, Again, that's not a, uh, a number that most people understand, but just trust me on that number. That's the balance point. If you put the uh, grip end and you have a 14 inch fulcrum, how much weight needs to counter that to get it to balance. But I probably built three to 5% of all clubs that I built were in that swing, rate range, swing weight range. Most of them were heavier. Um, the big thing to, that most golfers need to figure out, do I feel enough of the head? Can I tell whether the face is on the end of the stick even? Some, some golf clubs are so light, you know, you get a um, 70 or 60 gram shaft in that thing, which is what a lot of those graphite shafts that they're using today are, super lightweight. And you got, you know, a, the stick on the end of it with a, a head attached. And there's not a whole lot of feel there. You know, most of the time, those are D0 swing weights. You know, again, I'm an old guy, and my fairway woods are D4. Um, my hybrids are D4 with, you know, 75 gram shafts in them. Um, I want to feel the head. It's rare when I'm out on the golf course because I'm the guy who carries lead tape and I watch people and I see, well, there hey, it appears you don't feel much of the head the way you, you're swinging. The fact that you take a huge divot one time and the next time you miss the ground by, uh, you know, you just barely hit the top of the ball. Let's see if a little bit more weight on the end of that stick would help. Probably 95% of the time people go, I like this better. Um, and they then as they play, they make better contact. Now, unfortunately, I can't do that with all their clubs. I can do I'll do that with maybe one club out on the golf course. So we try to pick a club they're going to hit fairly often. But it's interesting to watch them when they go from hitting a club that has some extra weight to it to hitting another one, and they you know just look at me and go, yeah, I don't feel that. I like this one much better. And again, that's true with most golfers. Um, you don't want to get fooled if you go out to buy some lead tape. Don't get fooled and buy this stuff that looks like it's aluminum foil because you're going to have to put like, oh, 20 feet of aluminum foil on your club to make a difference. But lead tape wise, if you get a good dense lead tape, you know, start off with an inch and a half, two inches of lead tape and see if that makes a difference, if it, you feel more head. You can also put that lead tape on the shaft. You know, if the club feels just overall too light, I will put, you know, 10 inches, nine inches, eight inches, depending on the golfer of lead tape. And I kind of find, you know, okay, where's 14 inches from the grip? It's, without changing the swing weight, I can add some weight to the club. And a lot of golfers, it's, it's very noticeable. They Either, yeah, I like that, or mm, I don't know, that feels heavy to me. But that's without changing the swing weight, just making it heavier. And you can do both. You can add weight to the shaft, and you can put it down on the back of the club head. Most golfers worry about where that goes. Don't worry about where it goes, because you're not adding enough to make a significant change. Um, it cracks me up when they somebody comes in and they you know have a, would have a... a, a gram of lead tape on the heel and oh yeah this keeps me from from hooking or this keeps me from, you know uh, there have been drivers made that had 40 grams in the heel and i watch people slice them just as well as drivers without 40 grams in the heel um, it takes a lot of weight to to do to make that change and when they tell you in the with those adjustable drivers oh yeah if you change two grams oh, it'll completely change the ball flight. no only if you do the exact same thing every single time hitting it on the exact same spot might you see a change and it's a big might okay so 
hopefully this gives you some good information. Again, I apologize for Josh not being here and asking me those great questions that he usually comes up with. Um, but he will be back next time. We're going to be talking about shafts. And if you have questions about shafts, you can send us an email at clubfittingchronicles at gmail and we'll uh, try to answer those um, questions. We're not going to get into specific detailed details about shafts, but we're going to talk about generalities, things you need to understand, what things matter, what things don't. As you can tell by this podcast, we're into what really matters, not into what the hype is. Um, I've done enough research uh, to know that a lot of the hype is just that hype. I've known enough people in the industry when cornered and I don't have a microphone on them and I ask them questions, they will tell me the truth about, yeah, no, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, so anyway, I hope that you have a great Thanksgiving. If you're listening to this before Thanksgiving and if it's after Thanksgiving, I hope your Thanksgiving was good. And we will talk to you and uh, hopefully hear from you soon. And take care.